And you would know that that had happened according to Darby's scenario because they would begin with an event called the rapture when all true Christians would be lifted bodily out of the earthly arena. And this is based on a passage in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. Um, so the rapture so that the good Christians would escape the terrible tribulation to come. So we can see this here on the chart. Rapture. There's always an arrow up on these charts. <laughs> Tribulation to come. Still, older traditions remained embedded in the apocalyptic imagination. The tendency to identify Antichrist with a grasping world leader or to paint one's fatherland and its rulers in a last world emperor type role, has emphatically endured, even among premillennial dispensationalists. From the notion of a Russian antichrist unleashing nuclear holocaust, there it is. See? The perennial up arrow. <laughs> To post 9-11 speculations on Osama bin Laden's apocalyptic role, there's been no shortage of apocalyptic finger pointing in the 20 and 21st centuries. Just a, up. That's right. Just a couple of more examples in case you didn't know. Premillennialist dispensationalism has remained a potent force in American religious and political life. Just as older apocalyptic symbols have continued to exert an irresistible pull for polemicists of all stripes. Just to remind you of the last presidential election. Is Obama the Antichrist? Is Bush the Antichrist? Apocalyptic language and imagery has a power that even the most secular have found it hard to resist. So for all of those reasons, I would suggest that the history of the end is a history that will not have an end. Unless it's on May 21st. No, actually, this was in Poughkeepsie, New York a couple of weeks ago. There is one Yeah, and there was one, there was one in Little Rock at Christmas time also. Yeah. So anyway, that's all I have to say. I'd be happy to answer questions if you guys have any. Yes, sir. A lot of the mystical writers in Christianity uh, associated with apocalypticism uh, were real outcasts in the church. What was Joachim uh, Fiora's status? Was he in orders? Was he considered a heretic? Uh, no, well, interesting status. First of all, he's a monk. He's, um, he starts out as a Cistercian friar, and then he actually breaks with the Cistercians. He doesn't, even though they're extremely strict, he doesn't find them strict enough, and so he starts his own order, the Florensian order, out of Fiora. He is consulted by popes. Um, he's, he's summoned to Rome, I think, in 1187 to interpret a new, believe it or not, Sibylline prophecy that has just shown up. At the same time, after Joachim's death, his writings on the Trinity were condemned. Not his apocalyptic writings, but his writings on the Trinity were condemned. Yes, there is, there's this strain of outcasts, and you, we can think of, of Jan Hus or Montanos in the, in the second century, but there's also a very, very mainstream line of, of apocalyptic thinking and writing about the apocalypse in the Middle Ages of people who do not get in trouble because this language if it, it can be used to support the status quo as well as it can be used to kind of encourage a radical overturning. And, you know, if, if you've got language that's supporting, you know, obey the pope or obey the emperor, uh, it's pretty attractive. None of the Dominicans were tonsured, but all of the Franciscans were in the picture. No, these guys or, were tonsured. <laughs> yes, none of them are tonsured. <laughs> Funny thing. <laughs> I don't know why. 
humanity obviously has a lot of self-destructive tendencies. So I was wondering what's the, I mean, is there an explanation or at least theory about explaining why this is so fascinating, why so many different cultures. Are there so are many, many theories. Yes, exactly. Like what, what is it about human beings? My favorite theory is actually by a literary scholar named Frank Kermode in a, in a nice little book called The Sense of an Ending. And he says, this is the way we like to tell stories, right? We like stories that have a beginning and a middle and an end. And not just the story of our life, or not just the story of Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but the story of all humanity. I mean, it's not just that we like the story of the end of the world, we also like the story of the beginning of the world. All, you know, almost all cultures have a creation story, too. It was probably back in the 80s when they thought the end times were coming and they had predicted a time. I was actually in a church. 88 re reasons the rapture will come in 1988. Right, right. Yeah. And I was actually in a church then that we actually studied that and it had the whole thing just like what you were telling about. And we uh, wrote, we took each took a Bible and during this course that we took, we actually directed people that were going to be left behind during the rapture where to go in the scriptures so that they would know what to do when they were left behind. Yeah, well, the really interesting thing, actually, in terms of like apocalyptic thought, is not 1948, but 1967, um, which is when then Israel takes actually Jerusalem. And so then, for like people like Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, this is what the, the, the great parenthesis is over. The prophetic clock is ticking again because the temple can be rebuilt and blah, 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 and it can all happen. And so there's actually, I mean, there's this sort of strange coalition between sort of premillennial dispensationalists and ultra conservative Jews in Israel to try to create the perfect situation for rebuilding the temple including there there has to be this you know this there has to be this perfect red heifer like entirely red with no white hairs that has to be sacrificed um, in order to purify the temple so th there's like Farmers in this country who are being paid to try to breed red heifers, and they keep on getting, you know, like one with one white hair or something. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's sort of like. I have a, a friend who's a historian at Boston University and has made his life's work studying millennial movements. His name is Richard Landis, and you can look him up on, online. Um, he runs, well, Back in the 90s, he had a lot of money for the Center for Millennial Studies at Boston University. He actually believes that apocalyptic ideas have done a lot of good. in the promise of this kind of, and particularly millennial ideas, which are actually the most dangerous apocalyptic ideas, because they're the ones that really prompt you to want that, you know, to want it to happen. Um, that the conception of this radical overturning of the present order um, for someone like, let's say, the Hussites in Bohemia in the early 15th century, where it, in, it's not just a religious transformation, but it's a social transformation where hierarchy is demolished, where a more sort of open and free society is to be there. So, so Landis has actually suggested that, well, I mean, he goes a little too far, but I think at some, at some points he suggests that every good idea ever was originally a millennial idea. So it's hard to say on the balance because there's also the flip side that when you start to think in terms of this polarized world and you think not that this is a group who has ideas different from mine that I could negotiate with or come to some compromise with, but this is the absolute forces of Antichrist and this is it and it's, you know, you know, there's no gray, it's black or white. That's also an extremely dangerous set of ideas, too. I teach my class every two years, and pretty much I can count that there'll be something in the news that, that fits. I mean, if, if it's not there before the semester begins, like, you know, last time it wasn't there before the semester began, but midway through the semester, sure enough, these people were holed up in Russia because their preacher had told them the end of the world was coming, and, like, they were down there in this cave and, and had no food and water, and children were starving, and it was a Russian winter. And, an intervention was staged, as they say. Um, are there some things that distinguish Christian apocalyptic thinking from the apocalyptic thinking in other religions? I know most about the Judeo-Christian tradition. I can say a little bit about Islamic apocalyptic, which is remarkably similar in the sense that there's an antichrist figure, there's a kind of hope of a good figure to come at the end. There's certainly cultures that have kind of a more cyclical 
apocalyptic sense, like um, ancient India, ancient Hindu beliefs, there are these big cycles. Like we're right now in the middle of something called the Kali Yuga that's like a, what, 430,000 year cycle. And at the end of that, the earth is recreated again. So it's not this kind of finality that's there in Christian apocalyptic, but a new cycle begins. So perhaps the most distinctive thing about Christian apocalyptic is that it's not cyclical. But I mean, that holds true also for Judaism and Islam. Who is the group that had that bul uh, billboard that said May 21st? It's family radio, or there's a group that you can look online, We Can Know. It's a pretty complicated series of reasonings by which they've come to May 21st, 2011, and you'll be shocked to know that they've had to redate it a couple of times. <laughs> but pretty much... They, they forgot to carry the four, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it's honestly like things like that. And so pretty much they're, um, they're playing with numbers in the Book of Daniel. Oh, yeah. I've made a couple of trips to uh, Guatemala. I know in Mayan mythology, 2012, uh, I don't speak Spanish, so, you know, I couldn't just ask everyone there their opinion, but the gist of it was no one's fearful. It's just a change in, the, in a cycle. Nothing was going to be destroyed. Or Do you have any insight on Yeah, I read a belief? little bit about this. I actually thought this was going to be my last lecture of the semester this year until May 21st popped up, when I guess that's going to be my last lecture. But um, here's... Here's what seems to be going on. Yeah, the Mayan calendar has this notion of cycles, and they're a good example. I mean, actually, a lot of Central American native cultures were good examples of this sort of periodic reforming and remaking the universe instead of a linear start and stop, and that's it. Most of what we know about Mayan culture is not actually from Mayan writing, but from stuff mediated through 16th century Spanish missionaries. Now, those 16th century Spanish missionaries, most of them good Franciscans, and Franciscans that are very imbued with these millennial apocalyptic ideas, especially as they're going off to preach Christianity to the four corners of the globe, are very much believing that they're creating the millennial kingdom in the new world. So they're pretty inclined to meld together Mayan stuff they read with their own millennial sensibilities. And so then the texts that we read, you know, in Spanish, that, you know, like the Mayan creation story, we don't have a Mayan creation story. We have a Spanish-mediated Mayan creation story. And so probably this also, this kind of apocalyptic sense is, it makes sense to me, is filtered through 16th century Franciscan apocalypticism. One last question I had. This latest uh, campaign here for May 21st, I went to their website, and they're calling May 21st the Judgment Day, the rapture. Right. And then uh, those of us who are left behind will uh, be tortured for five months, yeah. and then October 21st right. is, is the end of the world. Right. And presumably then we all go to hell for more torture. But, uh, right, <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Is, is there any historical basis behind that five-month uh, period? Again, I think they're just... probably playing with stuff from Daniel. There's this bizarre um, patristic and medieval tradition that takes two numbers in, there's two numbers in Daniel 12. One says something like, you know, blah, 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 1290 days. And then something about blessed is, it, blessed is he that comes to the 1345th day. And Jerome, in commenting on Daniel, said, okay, well, obviously we have to subtract. There are 45 days, basically, between the end of Antichrist and Judgment Day. And what's that for? Um, so medieval authors speculated on that. So, I mean, there may be four and a half months that they're, you know, kind of, I haven't read enough on that We Can Know website, which is overwhelmingly detailed and huge, to know where they got this period from. But. Well, let's have a big round of applause uh, for Dr. Smoller.